thank you for listening to the eighth webinar as part of our 2023 CKF webinar series. Uh, as we continue to discuss everything we feel is not discussed enough surrounding transplant and donation. In keeping with this theme, uh, this webinar will focus on pregnancy and transplant. A transplant diagnosis often leads to many questions from recipients and their families on the possibility of becoming pregnant um, and the safety of that pregnancy. Today, we'd like to share the journeys of several transplant recipients who became moms post-transplant, as well as information from our friends at the Transplant Registry International and National Kidney Foundation. Uh, my name is Anna Morgan Pilardi. I am the Program Communications Director for the Chris Klug Foundation, otherwise known as CKF, and I'll be introducing today's panelists. I'd first like to thank our generous sponsor, the Hearts for Rust Foundation, who helped make this series possible. Um, they do great work in the community. If you haven't already, please check them out. Um, thank you to all those who have submitted questions ahead of today's session. If you do have further questions for today's panelists, please send them to info at chriskluekfoundation.org. If you're interested in any of the, the other topics we will discuss during this year's webinar series, head to chriskluekfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists and give them a moment to introduce themselves and their organizations. First, I'd like to introduce Lisa, the Senior Research Coordinator for the Transplant Registry International and Chair of the American Society of Transplant Women's Health Community of Practice. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me, Anna. I'm thrilled to be here uh, again. And a little bit about uh, the what we call the TPRI. Uh, we've been collecting pregnancy information for over 30 years and are happy to share our information with anyone who has questions about pregnancy after transplantation. And, uh, you know, women's health is uh, very near and dear to my heart. And we are so grateful that the American Society of Transplantation has made this a priority. We had a, a controversies conference earlier this year and uh, we'll be publishing regarding that sometime next year also. Amazing. Thanks for all of your work, Lisa. Uh, next up, we have Joelle. Joelle is a double kidney and liver transplant recipient and mom to Wesley, as well as the 2020 CKF Bounce Back Award winner. Thanks for joining us, Joelle. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I had my first transplant when I was 18 months old and then a kidney and liver transplant when I was nine. So I didn't know at the time that I was gonna be a mom, obviously, but thank you so much for having me and letting me share my journey. And if only Wesley could be here running around right now, he would just love it. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Joelle. Uh, next up, we have Deborah. Deborah is a liver transplant recipient, CKF patient ambassador, and mom of three. Thanks for joining us, Deborah. Thank you, Anna. I too am very excited to talk about this topic. Um, I I just think it's amazing that uh, people in general get transplants, and then um, to have the ability to carry on life and and create like a new branch in your. Um, tree of life that wouldn't have been there before, I think is quite amazing. And I have to say, I'm excited to tell everyone, I am 35 years post-transplant this month. Yay. And uh, yes, and so I'm excited. I, you know, just like uh, Joella and probably everyone on here, we went through um, school and we had, um, I had a career in uh, molecular biology and I uh, went on to have three um, beautiful children while I was working. Um, so my oldest is 20. And then I have a 13 year old and a, um, a 15 year old and a 13 year old. And then I did have one miscarriage throughout my pregnancy journey, but um, as to be expected, I guess. So, but I'm excited to be here. Thanks Deborah, and congratulations on your 35 years. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, up next we have Haley, uh, who is our last guest speaker. She is a kidney recipient and mom of two, as well as being the director of transplant programs for the National Kidney Foundation or NKF. Thanks, Anna. I'm just uh, really thrilled to hear and see uh, all of you and to hear your stories. I think, um, like you mentioned at the beginning, Anna, this isn't talked about enough. And I think just knowing that you're not facing this alone is so huge. Um, I know it has been for me as a patient. I had kidney failure as a teenager. 
Um, and like you mentioned, I have uh, have two kids and I now get to spend all day, every day, thinking about how to help more people get transplants through education for patients, for the community, for prospective donors, um, as well as professionals who uh, definitely need to uh, and do a great job continuing to learn um, about all of the advances, both in you know medicine, but also really what patients need and want um, as they're kind of going through their their kidney or transplant journey. Awesome. Thanks, Haley. And thank you all again for joining us. So without further ado, let's delve into some questions. Um, first, let's start with the big question that we got a lot. Um, Lisa, le- uh, is it possible and safe for female transplant recipients to have children post-transplant? So it depends on a lot of factors, but once you have a successful transplant, fertility does return usually very quickly. Many patients with end-stage organ failure um, do not uh, get periods anymore. However, once a successful transplant happens, it can happen very quickly and you have to actually make sure you prevent it if you're not planning a pregnancy. Um, It's different with different organ recipients, but I think the main thing to think about is optimal transplant function prior to a pregnancy and making sure you're on medications that are safe for pregnancy. Because one of the main medications that patients are sent home on called mycophenolate mofetil, which is cell scepter myfortic, um, has been shown to cause birth defects and an increase in miscarriages. So that's why it's so important to plan a pregnancy after your transplant. Thanks for sharing. And on the back of that, uh, do you see a high level of success with certain transplants post-pregnancy? So um, there are kind of um, patients that do better than others. We find that the liver recipients deliver a little bit closer to term. They're on less immunosuppression long-term than some of our other transplant recipients. Um, So they deliver um, around 37 weeks, whereas our kidney recipients uh, usually deliver around 34 weeks, or 36 weeks, excuse me. Um, But uh, we see a lot more uh, preeclampsia and high blood pressure with kidney recipients. Heart recipients do very well too. And so, and lung recipients um, sometimes have some more issues than our uh, kidney, liver, and heart recipients. But it's really important to talk to your doctor about your family planning wishes because pregnancies have happened after all different types of organ recipients and combinations, liver, kidney, heart, lung. Um, So it it really, um, you know, can happen for anybody. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, it's such an important, you know, conversation to definitely bring up with your doctor and one I think women often hold back on um, on asking and, and make sure you're having that conversation and and reaching out to people that can help you. Um, Joelle, uh, as a liver recipient and mom, can you speak to your pregnancy? Are you aware of any different experience that you may have experienced during it uh, that may not experience by quote a regular pregnancy? <laughs> So I um, never really thought I could be a mom, honestly. Um, I, I thought maybe adoption or IVF or, or something else. Um, so when I talked to my doctor, my um, liver, liver doctor, I'm followed at Jefferson in Philadelphia, um, they were like, oh, yeah, it's no problem. You can have your own kids. Um, I'm currently, I'm going to be 25 years post-transplant this year, so um, it's been a long journey. But I never really thought that I could have kids. Um, so when I talked to my doctor, they were like, oh, yeah, it's fine. And so my first step was meeting with maternal fetal medicine um, through Virtua down in South Jersey. Um, and they were incredible and awesome and just so positive about everything. Um, as far as my pregnancy, um, I did have um, preeclampsia that um, was found at 37 weeks. Um, I had been doing weekly um, non-stress tests and um ultrasounds just to make sure that everything was okay starting at 33 weeks um and i I had had a non-stress test on monday everything was fine tuesday i was all of a sudden super nauseous and i had a bloody nose and i immediately went into um ob triage and they were like you're gonna have a baby this week um and that was at 37 weeks so um we we actually were really really impressed that i made it that far um, and we were really just like overjoyed that I got to 37 weeks. They were like, oh yeah, it's no problem. 
Um, and then the other thing that I had was gestational diabetes. Um, but I think that's actually genetic. My mom had it too with me. So when she was pregnant with me, so I don't know if that was necessarily tied to the transplant. Um, and just one more thing that I want to say, um, what I had, I ended up having a C-section and I ended up at a different doctor, um, up in North Jersey or central Jersey. And that doctor had no plan for my C-section. So, um, just definitely like encouraging that everyone make a plan with their doctor because um he had no plan and no idea and i have an anterior kidney so it was very stressful um when they had to make the incision and make the cut um and that's kind of the only complication i actually had a lot of bladder pain and they found that because of that way everything shifted um they almost cut my bladder when they did a c-section but thankfully i screamed in pain and everything was fine so <laughs> um and wesley was born healthy no NICU time or anything even though he's a bit early um and i ended up not going, doing pretty well so sorry that was a long-winded answer no, that was an amazing answer. Thank you for sharing that. And I think you touched on sort of two important topics there. One, people rule themselves out before really asking the question and make that assumption. And two, making sure you have a plan in place. And it kind of goes back to as a transplant recipient, you know, you learn to become your own advocate and you still, you know, in this term pregnancy as well, being your own advocate, making sure you have that plan in place um and knowing being knowledgeable um really really does help um i just wanted to throw out and see if deborah or Haley wanted to add anything maybe about their experience um having you know their pregnancy post-transplant oh I, I did want to add one thing uh you said you didn't have the plan for the c-section right i found that i was planning so much about should i have a child okay, what are the things to do during the pregnancy? And I just assumed from, from that point forward, someone would take care of everything else, right? Like that's where you go to a doctor. And I do think that that's one thing that I know I didn't think about was the, okay, so we get to this day, make sure we understand the day and what should we do in concern with our medication post um, pregnancy? So I think those are the steps that I think are often overlooked because you're you're so overwhelmed by the beginning steps that you forget, like, maybe I should have taken a look at those. And you're too busy. Once you have your first child, you realize that there isn't, well, mama brain takes over and a few other things make it a little bit harder to, to look into everything else. So I, I do agree with that. That was just, I, I think, Joelle, hearing your experience, I was really struck by the fact that you've been told you could have kids. Um, so I actually, so I had, I had kidney failure as a teenager. Um, and I remember being told even then that having children would be very difficult. I wouldn't be able to breastfeed and kind of like prepared me for the, the worst, I think. And that actually made me a lot more fearful, I think, than I needed to be. Um, and set kind of a, a really sort of scary expectation in my mind um, from a really young age. And it wasn't until I saw a different doctor years later when I was getting married to, to bring up this scary topic that I, I met someone and they said, oh, yeah, of course, we can help you with that. Like, that's something we can do. Um, and that like blew my mind because that's not the message I'd been hearing for, for years. Um, and I think and, and likewise with with breastfeeding. Um, I was told I never could. I was halfway through my pregnancy before someone told me, actually, no, that's, that's, you know, we've, we've learned since, since then. And you can, we just want to watch for this, that, and the other thing. Um, so for, for me, that was a big, actually part of my journey was getting the right team to help me and support me that felt comfortable with it. And a huge part of that was the maternal fetal medicine. So like a specialist OB, who's just used to this kind of thing. Like this is what they do all day. Um, and they were fantastic. They um, provided really great care. Um, so I had, you know, my first pregnancy was a, a, like a, just just a lot. <laughs> um, but, but in terms of my transplant, um, really did very well. Um, made it to 37 and a half weeks. I was induced, um, had a pretty normal delivery. Um, and I, I, and the, my second pregnancy was a little bit stranger. Um, but again, it had nothing to do with my transplant. Like all of the things that got like a little funky with my pregnancy had nothing to do with my transplant, which was fascinating. And I'm almost 15 years out 
Um, so yeah, I, I think that point around being your own advocate is really important. Um, and just asking questions and, and voicing what it is that you want and like your goals and hopes and dreams with your team um, and, and trying to find a team that can help support you in that. I think um, what one of my uh, messages always is for healthcare professionals is we need to um, standardize what we say to people. And it's so variable what patients get a message about pregnancy after transplant. If they've had one or two bad outcomes, they, they might not even talk to patients about it. And that's my hope is that um, everybody can find us so they can get the best information available. Because um, not every physician is aware that pregnancies can be smooth and, and people do well for long-term um, post-pregnancy also. Yeah, I mean, you go to a transplant specialist, you go to a, you know, a pregnancy specialist, you should go to the combination. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to Haley here. Uh, you have, you're both an NKF employee and a kidney recipient. Can you talk about pre how pregnancy uh, experience may differ for a kidney recipient in comparison to uh, other transplants or regular pregnancies? Yeah, so I, I think Lisa did a good job touching on kind of the key things, which sounds like are pretty similar across different types of transplants. Um, one, making sure that um, you're kind of in a good place health wise as you can be um, and, and taking that kind of, you know, planned approach is ideal. Um, and mostly in the kidney world, we usually recommend at least like a year out to give your body time to adjust. Um, and then uh, looking at your medications is really, really important and working with your team um, to make sure you're on the, the right mix. Um, and I know for me, my kind of, again, Lisa, to your point around standardization, um, every provider I've seen does it a little differently. Like how much time do you need to adjust to a different medication before you might want to get pregnant? I've heard six weeks. I've heard three months. Like it, it, the range is really big, but, you know, expecting some amount of time to make those medication adjustments. Um, and I, I, I know for myself, um, when I kind of went into that, I, again, I was a little nervous. I was, I was told this could be a disaster. Um, and it was totally fine. And in fact, I liked the different, the new medication so much that I'm not planning to go back. Um, cause I only have to take it once a day, which is really nice. <laughs> um, and then other than that, I think, again, uh, Lisa mentioned a few of these things, um, in terms of being at high risk for high blood pressure and preeclampsia and some of those things that come with the territory of kidney disease in general. Um, so a lot of those things, if, if you, um, depending on the cause of your kidney disease and kidney failure in the first place, you may be needing to watch out for those things even more closely. Um, so, so for myself and um, I think for any kidney recipient who's pregnant, you can expect a lot more monitoring than a typical pregnancy. So you may have more blood draws, more visits, more ultrasounds, um, and especially looking for blood pressure and things like that to make sure that everything's where it, where it should be. Um, as the pregnancy goes along. I always tell patients it's like right post transplant, you know, you're you're out so long, you're probably only seeing your transplant doctors once a year. And with pregnancy, you're going to start seeing them every month again, and maybe every couple of weeks so that that follow up um, gets much uh, more often uh, when you're um, pregnant. And you're also seeing your OB at the same time and maybe other specialists. So there, there's a lot of appointments um, towards those last uh, two months of your pregnancy. Yeah, I mean, they're there to support you. Use them, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Zebra, uh, you were a teenager when you received your transplant. So obviously at the time, ensuring you, you received a, your life-saving transplant was the primary focus. But as you became older, was there a fear um, of your transplant affecting your ability to become pregnant, maybe both for yourself and for your family? The quick answer is no, because I had the same experience that Haley had, or more Joella, I think, where I went to the doctor and asked, and they were like, oh, yet yeah, your transplant, you know, I don't want to say cured you, but your transplant made you as normal as everyone else. So you moving forward with pregnancy is no different than anyone else, aside from the fact that, you know, you just have to take a, 
um, precautions and, you know, monitor your grafted organ or your transplanted organ. So um, in that regards, but I was 14 when I had my trans, when I had my transplant and then 14 years later, then, I mean, so a lot of years of research passed between that time. So when I actually started having children, um, things were obviously different from what they were and, you know, from the, that time frame. So, um, and um, the other thing I, I worried about was that I had a genetic disorder and that's the reason I needed my transplant. So that um, worried me. And, and since that time, it's worried some of my friends who also have, I've met through the transplant world who have the same um, genetic disorder and that worried them. So the one thing, um, it wasn't available back in 1988 when I was sick, but you can sequence now, right? So you can determine if you or your spouse has the chromosomal, um, uh, has the um, mutations, I should say mutations are the, you know, autosomal recessive disorders that you might have. So that will help you predict whether or not your child would carry this disease. And we did do that. And that was, um, you know, it was less than like a 99%. It was, you know, a 99% chance that we would not um, have this genetic disorder in my children, although they would be carriers because it's an autosomal uh, recessive disease. So I have two recessive genes. So they do, they are carriers, but that doesn't affect them per se um, to live a normal life. So as in concern with the um, pregnancy, there was no concern if I, you know, could have it because I'm a healthy woman. Um, we did uh, take a look at my medicine. So that's one thing I would say transplant women should think about. Um, take a look at your medicine. Is there anything that maybe you could get off of without um, causing harm to your transplanted organ, right? And so we did take a year and I, I went off of everything I could and we looked to make sure my liver was stable, everything was good. And I just remained on actually one, um, one immunosuppressive medication um, when I started having children. So that was one thing I did do. And I kind of insisted on because I was taking a steroid at the time and I didn't, that was one red flag for me. I didn't want to have that um, even be a consideration. If I could live without it, then I would like to try the pregnancy without that as well. So um, that was what I, what I was, that's kind of what my pregnancy, pre-pregnancy story was where we just kind of lowered the medication. And then um, from there on, it was everything that Lisa described uh, monthly, weekly, you know, I, I felt like a pin cushion by the end, but, um, I did have, um, the one thing, because I'm a procrastinator, I do wish they would have told me, I didn't find out until my fourth pregnancy that a doctor said to me, Oh, we would never let you go past 38 weeks. And as a procrastinator, I assumed I would always go to 40 weeks or more. And so I didn't always have the crib on the first child. I didn't have those things. She came at 35 weeks. She was induced, um, uh, because of, it was, it was um, just, you know, my body had stopped making the amniotic fluid. So it was low amniotic fluid. So she was induced for that reason. And each pregnancy had, again, like Haley said, had its own special changes towards the end, but we resulted in, in healthy children. So, um, and my only suggestion is make sure you understand the post-care, like how quickly should you start decreasing your medication because your body fluids increase so much during pregnancy that they do have to increase your meds just to keep the levels correct in your body. So, you know, you kind of need to plan after. So you don't, I did feel kind of sick after my my first pregnancy because they did not decrease those as quickly, I think, as they should have. And I got, I, got, I felt very ill from the medicine. I'll just add to that. I, I, I had um, kind of a similar experience where I hadn't really thought about it and no one really thought about it. And so I was in, in the hospital actually and trying to, trying to teach the, the residents that I needed like a tacrolimus level at a certain time of day. And if they didn't take it at that time of day, it was useless information. And it was like very dramatic the first time around because no one really knew what they were doing. Um, but, you know, I, I couldn't direct them. And the second time around, it was much smoother because I, I kind of knew what was coming and I could kind of help set things up. But yeah, I couldn't agree more, Deborah, though, even, you know, as soon as you deliver, having some idea of what you're going to do with your medications, because you change very quickly. I just wanted to piggyback that I actually didn't have any medication changes during pregnancy. Um, they didn't increase. Everything stayed very um, 
my blood levels, like my creatinine and everything were lower because your blood volume is more, uh, but I actually didn't have any medication changes at all. So I think it definitely, I don't know if it's the standard of care or things like that, but I actually, um, everything stayed the same and is still the same from before. I think it's just different with everybody, just like almost if you go to any transplant center across the country, their immunosuppression immunosuppression that they uh, prescribe is just a little bit different. Each place has kind of their own way of doing things. I th that's what I've seen uh, with talking to people um, over the last 25 years. There's millions of different combinations of immunosuppression that is used. Yeah, to piggyback on that, unrelated to pregnancy, but you find in the transplant world, once you start talking to other transplant patients, that this hard, fast rule that you were taught, they were taught just the opposite. Like, oh, I should never take acetaminophen. And they're like, oh, no, no, I was told never to take ibuprofen. Oh, and you're like, oh, I was told never to eat yogurt. Oh, no, no, they said eat yogurt. It's a great, it's a great, you know, probiotic for your life. And I was just like, oh, okay, so I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna kind of feel this all out. <laughs> I think that's why the, these kinds of conversations are so valuable and hearing from people who had other journeys. Cause I mean, when I started um, down the path of wanting to get pregnant, I didn't know anyone. I didn't know a single woman who had had a transplant and a baby, uh, you know, and I think I would have asked more questions, right. Of my team that was like, not a good idea. Um, had I known that and when I shared that I'd had a baby, I had people approaching me, other kidney transplant recipients who were saying, wait a minute, like I was told the same thing. Like I was told I couldn't have kids. I was told this, that, and the other thing. And I just didn't know. Um, so I, I love that we're having this conversation. I love hearing from, from both of you um, because I think it's, it's just hard to know what you don't know um, and, and get that both confidence and inspiration um, if this is something that you want to, to try to pursue it. Yeah, I have to say that um, I think Facebook has um, done a great thing. There are two groups on Facebook. One's called Pregnancy and Motherhood plus organ transplant. They just changed the name recently. But I think it's great because it's a group of women that just talks about their experiences. And did you have this during pregnancy? I mean, we know social media is not always great for everything, but it really can bring people together from all across the world that have had these same experiences, you know, where um, walking down the street, you, you might never meet someone who's had a transplant and a baby. Um, so it, it's really um, a wonderful thing, a resource for patients as well. We also offer um, for the at the National Kidney Foundation um, the NKF Peers program. Um, so we connect uh, people with kidney disease at at uh, you know kind of any stage with someone who's been there and actually living donors as well. If, if someone's interested in, in donating a kidney, um, because we know how important that is. And I've, I've actually uh, you know gotten to be a mentor to somebody who is going through this um, because we had this shared experience of you know, interested in pregnancy and in growing our families. So, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's out there. Um, if that's something that you're looking for, I think that's a great one. Um, and we can even help connect you with someone to, to talk to about what it was like for them. Finding your support group, um, you know, whether it's for a transplant, whether it's for pregnancy, post-transplant, um, they're out there and, and finding them, you know, reach out, CKF is here, NKF, um, uh, TPR, TPRI <laughs> is also out there to help and support you. Um, and there's plenty of other organizations doing the same thing. Um, and we really all work together um, for the same goal. So please reach out. Um, Lisa, in regards to the baby, um, is there a risk that they will be affected by their mother's transplant? Um, if so, what is the likelihood of this? And are there any steps that can be taken to prevent this? Um, overall, no. Um, besides the mycophenolate that I mentioned, we really haven't found um, any problems with um, the main immunosuppression that patients take. Uh, I think we talked about it a little bit with uh, genetic diseases. 
So that's something that might need to be looked at ahead of time, depending on what the cause of your end stage um, organ disease was. We've had a couple of um, you know heart recipients whose children have needed heart transplants kind of before they knew, you know, it was a genetic disease. So it's just something to think about ahead of time. But overall, you know, we've had, um, I'll call them babies that are 50 years old now and having children themselves. And, you know, their mothers had transplants in the 70s, back when we didn't even have um, the immunosuppression that we have nowadays to help patients. So it's really um, kind of a whole new generation that was born thanks to organ donation. And I think the genetic point is, is another one to touch on. Um, so my brother-in-law is on the heart transplant wait list um, and he has a genetic uh, mutation. And it's something that I'd never thought about, my husband hadn't thought about, but suddenly someone asked us the other day, you know, what's your plan? Um, has he gone and got tested? Has your husband been tested? And we hadn't, you know, thought about it. We're not at a point yet to want to have kids, but suddenly both of us are looking at each other going, oh, as family members, you know, it's something to also be aware of, um, of those who are family members of someone with a genetic mutation who's looking at a transplant um, to definitely look at that. So thank you guys for sharing that. And there's um, definitely genetic counselors, right, Anna, that you can, and Lisa, that yeah. you can reach out to and just ask your doctor for some recommendations because you shouldn't, you know, don't have to research that on your own and figure out genetics yeah. as, yeah. yeah. No, definitely. there's people who go to school for that. <laughs> Not <Yeah>. me, <laughs> but, um, you know, usually through your maternal fetal medicine doctors, um, they might recommend someone. Um, mm -hmm. And it, depending on whether you need a blood test or um, just looking at family trees, um, they have a whole protocol that they follow. Yeah, there was a swift call to, to my brother-in-law's doctor. Where do we go? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Deborah, uh, breastfeeding is a common concern for transplant recipients looking to become mothers. Is this something you chose to do and how did you come to that decision? Yeah, that's a great question. So again, I was 20 years ago when I was first researching this topic for when I wanted to have my first child. And um, I would suggest four things, right? Do your research that you can do on it. Um, talk with the doctors that you know. Um, there's breastfeeding consultants too that you can reach out to, not just physicians, but also breastfeeding consultants. And also um, reach out to the pediatrician who either you know or you might be using for your children and they may have some good suggestions for you too. Um, a little bit about my story with the breastfeeding is, so uh, when I was um, looking to become pregnant with my first child, I was doing research at University of Chicago. So I had access to all um, the, you know, the research I could, back then it wasn't so easy it is today to get, like you had to go to journals and kind of copy things. But so I did do a lot of research on is breastfeeding safe? Because I, uh, you know, I was getting different answers, as you can imagine, Lisa, right? So what I found interesting about the research was that in general, at that time, it was kind of you kind of the answer was kind of no don't do it it's you know you will be passing along the immunosuppression in your milk and that will pass along to your baby and it's kind of uncertain whether or not that affects their central nervous system or affects their um their own immunology development within their body so um however on the other side i did find some articles it was funny it was always a nurse it was always a nurse who was a transplant recipient who said i don't care what you say i'm breastfeeding my child and then they had some post re re results on that but the the ones i found the kids were only they weren't to puberty yet so again i was a little bit i don't know yet and then um i was still you know because my baby came at 35 weeks and i was still belaboring this point so with my first child my um actually my maternal fetal medicine doctor looked at me and she said you know i was breastfed you know, I mean, I was, I was, I was fed formula. Your child will develop normally if you feed them formula. So it's not like you're harming your child because you're choosing to not breastfeed. So I did choose to go that route. And then I just kind of stuck with that with all, with all of my children so that later in life, they wouldn't yell at me in case something developed in life and they wouldn't say, oh, you breastfed her, but not me. So uh, that's, that's kind of my uh, take on that. So, and it really, it's a personal decision and it's good either way. So don't feel like horrible that you chose one way or the other way, either way will, will, in my opinion, will result in healthy babies. So there's so many other things to worry about in life too, after breastfeeding. So. 
I always also tell people breastfeeding seems like it should be natural and easy, but it's not always natural and easy for everyone. And if you're a transplant mom, you have to take care of yourself as well. So you have to make sure you're able to take your medications and take care of yourself, make sure you're drinking and eating. And so if it doesn't happen, there are millions of us that were not breastfed and do just fine. However, like Deborah mentioned 25 years ago we never could recommend it and nowadays I think luckily due to um, some studies and um, some of uh, the data that we've collected we have found that so far we have not seen any problems with women breastfeeding so it, it's something that is um, nice to be able to tell people if they want to um, go down that road um, do either of you know, so again, 20 years ago, I was told the pediatrician said, well, the only thing is we would have to do weekly like um, finger pricks to the baby to make sure we understood what the cycle, what the level of medication yeah. was in them. What is the thought today? They don't, they don't test at all. I think, um, I don't know exactly why, but one, they don't know what all, it, there, a lot of times it's undetectable. Then you also have um, our insurance problems. Who's going to pay for that? is it necessary? Um, so I think it's, it's a combination of reasons, but I have not found that most do not get um, weekly blood tests. So I've, I have I have two kiddos, um, an eight-month-old and a three-year-old, and I've breastfed both of them and still am. Um, and it's uh, it's been great for me, and I'm like so glad I've gotten to do it. Completely agree with Deborah and Lisa that it's it's not for everyone and it's not always easy. Um, so you absolutely have to make the decision that works best for you and your family. And for me, um, it's it's been a great experience. It's very convenient. Um, and they I've I've um, my pediatricians for my children have always like known that I'm immunocompromised, um, but they they've never had any reason or any recommendation or guidance to test them for anything. They're both very healthy. Um, so I think, you know, in, in my research and, and working with my MFM in my first pregnancy, you know, we kind of looked into every medication and, and you know, the, the things that we know today are that very, very little gets to the, like so little that gets to the baby that there's no reason to assume there's going to be a problem. Of course, if, you know, it seemed like your kid was having an issue, then maybe they would look into it. But um, for the most part, it, it's not standard. Um, I will say, though. One thing that I didn't expect that this kind of reminds me of is um, post-transplant being immunocompromised and having small children, um, getting sick <laughs> often is a part of, you know, I think, I think that's like a normal parenthood experience, um, but particularly post-transplant, there are a couple of things that um, I've had to kind of watch out for. Um, you know, there's some, you know, when my kids receive a live vaccine, um, for example, having to be a little bit extra careful and, and things like that. So um, the journey doesn't end uh, when you have a baby. It continues. In fact, it's just the beginning. Um, and so there will, you know, it's just conversations to keep having with, um, you know, with my doctor and, and with their pediatricians about, OK, you know, knowing this about me, is there anything else that, you know, I should be looking out for when my kids get this, that and the other thing? Because they will. I was just thinking about that when you were talking. I'm going through that now. My little guy started daycare in September and it has been a roller coaster and I have been sick more than him um, because he gets it for a day and I get it for a week. So um, not something that I definitely thought about at the time, but I also, I work in a school, so I think that's also part of it. Um, but definitely not something that came to the forefront um, and something that I ever thought to ask my doctor, like, what about getting sick all the time? And they were like, oh, it's fine. And I'm like, okay, but maybe not for everyone, but definitely the conversations have to keep, keep continuing because it's not something that I ever thought of. So yeah, just piggybacking off of that. <laughs> yeah, thanks for bringing that point up. That is definitely an important one that I had not thought of either. Um, and it has not been one that's been asked so far, which is surprising, um, but yes, a very important, in fact. Um, so Haley, we've spoken a lot about the impact on women, but I wanted to touch on transplants um, for men and the ability to become a father. Um, is there any information about the impact of a kidney transplant on men's ability to become a father? 
Yeah, so it's uh, the, based on the information we have now, men can, can definitely father children after they receive a transplant. Uh, it definitely can happen. Um, it never hurts to talk to your healthcare team, um, just especially, you know, as we mentioned, kind of genetic conditions, medications, never hurts to have that conversation um, with your doctor. But um, for, for, for most men, it's not a problem. Um, and if you have been trying for a while and haven't been successful, again, um, having a conversation with your doctor about that is a good place to start because it could be transplant related, could not be. Um, so having that conversation is is a good place to start. And I think it's also just um, to, I want to mention that we don't see the same problems with mycophenolate with men that we do with women. So it really um, only affects during a pregnancy, and we have not found any problems with men fathering pregnancies while on mycophenolate or Celsept or Myfordic. So it's, it's important to note. And we do collect outcomes, even though most men don't think of registering with a pregnancy registry. So, and their outcomes are much different than uh, the women, mostly delivered around 37 weeks and the babies are seven and a half pounds um, closer to the general population. We really haven't seen any issues uh, with men fathering pregnancies. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. It is important to touch on both. There are two parts to this. <laughs> um, so Joelle, uh, when you made the decision to become a mom, were there any particular resources and tools that helped you to either come to that decision or that you used to help achieve your goal safely? Um, so I don't remember if it was Haley or Deborah, but somebody had touched on the fact that they didn't know anyone who had had a transplant. I think it was Haley. Um, and I was similar. I had one. So I've volunteered at um, transplant camps and I've been involved in the community. And I didn't, I knew one person that had had a baby post transplant. So I spent a lot of time like reaching out to her and asking like about her experience. Um, also with one, friends that I knew that had had babies via surrogate. I reached out to them as well just to kind of get their experience. Um, and then the transplant pregnancy registry, Lisa, I talked to you on my absolute worst day. Um, I had had a really bad conversation with my doctor and I reached out to you and you made me feel so much better with all of the data and all of the information that you shared with me. I don't know if you remember that conversation. It was over two years ago, but um, or about two years ago, but it was just, I had had a, a very tough conversation with the doctor um, and you just said made me feel so much better about everything and sharing your knowledge was amazing. So definitely reach out to the Transplant Pregnancy Registry um, and anyone that you know, um, reaching out to any of us as well. I'm sure I, I'm definitely happy to provide any resources or information or just my experience um, because I think just hearing other stories was really beneficial for me to know that it could be done and it could be safe and I could be safe and he could be safe. I'm glad I was able to help that it's I think probably one of the most rewarding parts of my job is to be able to give people the correct information and it's not always doom and gloom don't get me wrong there are certain people that probably shouldn't embark on a pregnancy or it might be more high risk um, but it's definitely like I said something that I wish providers would come to the table um, with uh, kind of not the paternalistic attitude and just give you the facts and, and not always try and do scare tactics sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I definitely put your hand up and ask for help. There's plenty of us out here that will either connect you with someone that can help or have the information like Lisa um, to share with you. Um, or experiences like Joelle, Deborah, and Haley um, to share with you as well. Um, so before we close out today's session, I like to do this and throw a question at you all. Um, if there's somebody watching who is looking to get pregnant or wanting that experience, what would, advice would you give to them um, today? Um, I was just going to say um, definitely the first step is talk to your doctor. Um, and then talk to your family and see what kind of support you'll have um, and your, and see how you can grow your family um, through that way. And But definitely the first step is talk to your doctor and make sure that it's safe because it, 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 
everyone is different and everybody is different and every transplant journey is different and therefore every pregnancy and, and motherhood and fatherhood journey is different. So definitely um, talk to your doctor is like the biggest thing and finding a team that you trust as well. Um, I would just say, you know, um, we're so lucky to have had a transplant and it's such a precious gift um, that we definitely want to preserve our gift and honor all those amazing donors who donated their organs um, so that we could live. But they donated your organs so you could live and live the life that you dreamed. So if parenthood is part of what you want to, uh, uh, what you dream about, then follow all these resources that we said here today and see if it's a great decision for you. Yep. And, and I agree. I think um, the planning step is so important. Like we mentioned, making sure you're on the right medications, making sure, you know, your transplant is working as best as possible before a pregnancy is really going to help. Um, we didn't mention it specifically. I know Haley mentioned it, but waiting at least one to two years after your transplant. Most people know that that first year after transplant, you're at most risk for infection, rejection, and just surgical problems that can happen in that first year. So it's really um, best to optimize your health prior to a pregnancy. And we also know, you know, you can have more high blood pressure after a uh, transplant and diabetes. So it's really important to make sure everything is under good control before going into a pregnancy. Because like I tell people, if you're having an issue, pregnancy is not going to help it. Um, so it, it's, you know, and even in um, the general population, if, if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, that's not necessarily going to get better during pregnancy. So it's important to really optimize your health um, before um, embarking on pregnancy. And I've also heard from many people who grow their families in different ways also. So um, even though it can be expensive and time consuming, there are other ways to grow your family um, besides having a child yourself, like uh, Joelle mentioned with surrogacy um, and adoption and IVF. So we've, we've kind of heard all different kinds of stories from people. Yeah. Haley, do you have anything to add? <laughs> I think those were all great. And I think, again, I'm, I'm coming from a place in my journey where I, I, for a long time, didn't have support and was told no. Um, so I, I would just encourage people to advocate for themselves, to keep asking questions. And, and if you, uh, and I would talk to more than one doctor if the first one says no. Um, it, it could be that really, truly, your individual health situation is such that it's really not a good idea to get pregnant. Um, and I, I do think that I've had enough, you know, as we've talked about several times, there's so many different answers and so many different ways of approaching this that, um, you know, speaking to a different doctor or to, to someone else um, who's, who's been there can help give you um, a full perspective of what your options are. Um, and then be able to make the best decision for you based on, um, you know, what, what you need, what you want for your family and for yourself, um, you know, and, and not, uh, not be put in a place where that decision is taken out of your hands. Thank you all for sharing this such, all such important points. Um, and speaking today, so that is it for today's session. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their journeys and their knowledge. Um, thank you for tuning in and taking the time to listen. Uh, we hope you found today's, in, uh, today's session inspiring and informative. Again, if you have any questions for the panel or about anything else, we have discussed this webinar series. Please head to chrisklugfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and live life, give life.